such a person would be prosecuted under the Trade Descriptions Act. And I was just using that analogy. But why are you so serious about rubbishing astrology and astrologers? Because presumably, at worst, it's just a bit of fun. Fun, this word fun. I'm, I take science very seriously. I think science is a beautiful thing. I think astrology is very beautiful. I think the universe is very beautiful. And I think it is uh, demeaning and cheapening to get fun. Uh, not that it really is very much fun, I suggest, um, from this kind of thing. So I suppose maybe I am a bit too serious, maybe I'm a bit um, po-faced about it. But I take science seriously, I take astronomy seriously, and I don't like it being cheapened. Jonathan Kainer, in our lead studio, why should we take astrology seriously? Because astrology has plenty to offer, because astrology offers understanding, because it offers inspiration, and because it offers a way of looking at the universe and our relationship with the universe, which can broaden our perspective of the role that we play in everyday life and society. But how can we possibly believe in the 20th century that the position of the planets at the time of our birth predetermines our fate? Well, I don't know that it does predetermine our fate, frankly. I think, um, you know, nor, nor for that matter, do I necessarily believe that there are any great sort of um, physical connections between what's happening in the sky and what's happening uh, on the Earth. But there's a symbolic relationship, and to me it would be pretty odd if we had this amazing timekeeping system with the, the movements of the planets in their orbits and the way in which they all interplay with one another and the phenomenal potential within this great cosmic clock for us to tell what kind of a time or what kind of a season it is, it would be very strange if all that had been put there and there was no purpose or rhyme or reason to it. Jerome Rivette's champing at the bit to get in there. Carry on. Yes, this sounds like a wonderful uh, apology for poetry, but not for something that calls itself a science. Well, I don't really know quite where we stand with science, okay? I mean, you know, I, I, the point is, science is a word, as far as I understand it, with a broad definition. In fact, interestingly enough, I mean, I, I brought with me the dictionary today because um, I wanted to have a look at the, de the definition for science. It goes on for an awful long way um, without being very clear about where the difference between something that is a science or isn't a science exists. All I can tell you is that I approach my work scientifically. I don't make it up. I don't just uh, c create predictions out of thin air. I follow a very strict set of uh, traditional rules and regulations laid down by my predecessors, and I have to justify every prediction I make to the other members of my astrological community. And if they don't like what I've said, they have a right to come along and say, well, excuse me, you can't say that because this planet and that planet don't mean this. Jerome Rivets, that's fair enough, isn't it? Uh, not quite fair enough because uh, science doesn't, as we know it now, doesn't generally operate by accepting a received tradition uncritically. Science is all about criticism and change. Uh, and let's leave it at that. And do you have criticism and change in astrology? Do you have well, new theories definitely. being tested? Do you ever refute anything in astrology? Yes, very definitely. All the time, astrologers um, are, are debating with one another about the relevance of certain traditions, deciding that uh, certain things which we've always been taught to uh, read into a horoscope might no longer be relevant or might be more relevant if we saw them in a different way. We have a dialogue between us. I mean, we have some difficulty in as much as we don't necessarily have all the academic resources that we would like to see in order to test some of our hypotheses. And we also have another problem. Because we're not academically recognized as a body, it becomes easy for anybody to wander in and say, oh, I'm an astrologer, I've read a book about it, and I'll tell your future. And there's no set of checks and balances to prevent this. So you get an awful lot of theories, and you get an awful lot of people saying, you know, oh, I do it this way. And um, we try our best to keep within the techniques and the systems that we know will work. Um, and to ask anybody who comes along with a new technique or system to prove it to us. All right, Jonathan, let's bring in Richard Dawkins. It hasn't been disproved scientifically. Fairies haven't been disproved scientifically. Mr. Kaner has said that he doesn't believe there's any physical influence from the heavenly bodies on human life. He says it's symbolic. What on earth is that supposed to mean, symbolic? How can <laughs> heavenly bodies possibly have a symbolic influence on human life? Well, by that I simply mean that um, as the planets align themselves in the sky, so we can read or interpret those alignments and see a symbolic influence or a, sim a symbolic reference to events which are taking place in our life. Is it a causal influence or not? Does it actually have an effect upon human life? And if so, how? By what route? I have no idea. I drive the car, I don't know how to fix the engine. Is there any evidence that it works? You say that you're subject to criticism among yourselves. Have you ever actually tested it to see whether your predictions come right? Have you ever done a prediction in advance 
and tested it statistically to see if it works. Yes, well, I don't know statistically, but I've certainly tested it. I've certainly, you know, um, I mean, I have my own personal record of predictions which I've made, which I've been very satisfied have come true. Um, but also, you know, yes, I try different techniques and I see whether they work or not. Now, a lot of those decisions have to be subjective and also the difficulty you have is that when you're making predictions for individuals, you have two problems. First of all, many individuals are very susceptible to influence. You say something to somebody and they agree with it. And there's also the little problem of self-fulfilling prophecy. So I never am quite sure whether some of my predictions have come true because I said it and it went into somebody's head or because it would have done anyway. So I've tried to test that too by sometimes not saying to people things that I expect to happen in their future, keeping quiet about it and waiting to see if it does happen, which unfortunately doesn't help the recipient of the advice, or would-be recipient, but is sometimes necessary for me, um, because I feel that there's a quite a sort of strong moral responsibility. I can see things in the future, and when I can, I have to be very careful how I say it. There are very satisfactory ways of testing whether predictions are right or not. You do it statistically. That means that you examine whether the predictions that you've made, uh, the apparently successful ones, are more than you'd expect by chance. This is a standard scientific method. It's not difficult to do. Um, otherwise, you're always open for the criticism that what you say would have come true anyway. Uh, it's, it, it is necessary to test your predictions properly and statistically if you want to be taken seriously. Why don't you do it? Well, OK, um, there are several things in this world besides astrology which operate on a non-physical, non-provable basis. For example, love. Uh, for example, art. I mean, for example, music, for example, religion and the existence of God. All these things cannot be proved, but nonetheless, many people feel them very definitely and deeply in their lives every day. They respond to them. They approach them in a methodical fashion. They have their rules, techniques, and methods of dealing with them. And as far as they're concerned, and as far as I'm concerned, all these things have cause and effect relationships with the way that we lead our lives. Jo Jerome, before you jump in there, let, let's put this one to you. Why then, given what Jonathan uh, is saying about people believing that it has an influence on their life every day, why why do you think that so many well-known people do believe in astrology? They need it. Well, people believe in all sorts of things. Uh, you can have people believing in different religions which are mutually contradictory. And you can have people, as I say, I have one set of beliefs which make them into good and meaningful people, which are totally contradicted by another set of beliefs which make other people into good and meaningful people. So the fact that people want to believe, do believe, are helped by it, uh, is in the realm of belief and behavior, uh, and is very valid uh, with its own problems, because contradictory beliefs can make people kill each other. Uh, but it's not science. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm still a bit concerned that uh, Jonathan can make this slide from uh, belief systems which may be very beautiful and may be highly articulated, like religious doctrines are, are articulated, or take a lot of skill and genius, like art, that's fine. But when he says, well, and then it's a science. Now, he may wish to say, well, of course, we, we're talking about different sort of science. And in fairness to him, over most of, most of humanity's history, in most civilizations, science has included this poetic element. Uh, it's only in our modern Europe in the last few hundred years that science has excluded poetry, shall we call it, excluded meaning, and concentrated on what Professor Dawkins will call hard causal connection. Now, maybe I could ask Jonathan whether he wants to take us back or over to a different conception of science where meaning and emotion and love are part of what we call science, or whether he's trying to say that astrology includes a component which would satisfy Professor Dawkins if only he would come and learn at Jonathan Kainer's feet. Jonathan? <laughs> well, I certainly wouldn't, uh, you know, be so bold as to say that uh, Professor Dawkins has to come and learn at my feet, but I would say that I'd be very happy to subject myself to any scientific test or to subject my art to any scientific test that was reasonably put, put forward. All the scientific tests that it's been put forward, uh, been put to so far, have actually come up with very satisfactory results, much to the horror and chagrin of uh, many people in the scientific community who seem to have a prejudice against it. Um, it is, however, a very difficult thing to measure because in many cases what astrologers deal in are predictions which have a subjective value. 
However, there ought to be, and I'm sure there are, ways in which we could integrate ourselves with science, and I really believe that science, in refusing to, to uh, put its resources into properly studying what astrology has to offer, simply saying, well, there's no point in studying that, it's a load of old rubbish, um, are missing out on a key to the universe. There is something in astrology, in the relationship between what happens in the sky and what happens in our lives on Earth, which science could deeply and dearly benefit from studying, investigating, helping we astrologers to overcome some of the mythology which has crept into our work and which is no longer relevant, helping us to perhaps, you know, fine-tune some of what we do, but at the same time they will find that within the essence of what we do, um, there is something to be learned. Jonathan Kainer under fire in Leeds, thank you very much indeed. And to my guests here in London, Richard Dawkins and Jerome Rivette, thank you very much. And we'll be back after this break. ...on the broader problem facing foreign governments, how to deal with human rights violations in China. That problem is certainly not going to go away. Not Sometimes as we go...